Moses was well aware of Planet X. He knew what it was. He knew it was coming around. He apparently had some kind of contact with the Anunnaki because he was able to get instructions and information from them to be able to uh, outsmart the uh, Israel, not the Israelites, the Egyptians were after them. And during that particular exodus that took place, they're called the Hyksos, the people that were exiled. And Hyksos translates into shepherd kings. And these individuals had been bleeding both Egypt and Babylon dry, much like our Wall Street individuals. And they were pretty much told to get the hell out, go. And they took the gold with them because, of course, they'd been stealing the gold. So that's who they were. That They weren't slaves. They were basically milking Egypt and Babylon dry. And um, the reason they had some kind of connection with the Anunnaki is because um, – that, that information was always there. Jacob had it. Jacob had a connection with the Anunnaki. And um, they were able to reestablish that. And that's who was feeding them when they were out in the desert, taking care of them. Um, there's some. The Sinai was called Sinai. The mountain we understand as Sinai is not Sinai. There was a, an expedition carried out shortly after, um, right after Admiral Byrd did his expedition to South Pole. They took the, I think it's called, I'm not going to get the name right, Sangient Bible. It's the one that's in Greek, and there were 70 translators for it. So anyway, the um, they took that Bible, and they started repeating what the Israelites had done on their way out of Egypt. And they came to this one location. It's a mountain <coughs> that rises right out of the ground uh, all by itself. It's not part of a, of a range. And the um, the mountain has these, I don't know what to call them. They're like piles of rocks, sort of like a, like a little altar, temple kind of thing out surrounding them. But on top of this mountain, when they climbed the mountain, they found an ancient Egyptian uh, temple. In the temple, they, they found this white powder in these huge baths. And uh, it was what you would call orm today, that white powder gold. And that's what Moses did with the golden calf. He burned it with the Ark of the Covenant. You would need to take it up into the mountain, and it's basically a giant capacitor. And it holds a uh, very high voltage, creates uh, between the two wings, a sort of a L St. Elmo's fire kind of lightning. And you burn the gold in that, it turns the gold into a powder, and then people can consume it. And when you consume it, it will actually make you more spiritual. It will make you, it will heal you of a lot of things, make you slightly telepathic. But if you're evil, just intrinsically evil, it can make the teeth fall out of your head, your skin melt off. It can do some really bad things to you. And that's also what's called the Philosopher's Stone and what the alchemists have been trying to recreate for so long. The um, the word for it, I don't remember it exactly, Shamana Nayana, something like that. It's uh, it's an Anunnaki word. It means, or it's, it's actually a Sumerian word. And it's the oldest translation of the word, uh, the what is it? Because it has no name. Mana means what is it? It's a question. And the Egyptians also called it the what is it? And this um, translation, the oldest known name of it, is called Starfire Brought to Earth by the Anunnaki. So, um, this powder is what's called the, the white orm. And when Christ did his 40-day fast in the desert, that's what he did it on, this orm. He was um, supposed to drink nothing but water for the first nine days and then start consuming the white powder. And all the pharaohs had to go through this particular uh, fast, and when Christ did it, it's supposed to make you pretty much everything Christ did. Um, after a gestation period, you start to become more telepathic. You can levitate. You can bilocate. You can uh, basically alter alter the illusion that we are in. So uh, whether he got his powers from that, I don't know. Um, I know he was already incredibly spiritual and had other abilities before that ever happened. But that was um, – a very important rite that the what they would call the the Messiah would have had to have gone through and survived it. So there's a big connection between Planet X and the um, the Jews during the Exodus. Planet X was what took place at that time. Um, all the plagues of Egypt are recorded around the world. The Chinese record that the this sub this red 
powder falling on the planet, uh, what they call the sky boulders. And there's so much destruction left in its wake that the uh, everything is just you, – you can't eat anything. Everything's covered in red powder. The ocean's a mess. But shortly after that, there's an explosion of life. And in geography uh, – geology, they uh, – or I'm sorry, biology, they noticed that most everything on the planet has this phosphorus in it. Our blood has phosphorus in it. Yet phosphorus is not an element that should be on the surface of a planet. When a planet is forming, it's heavier, so it would have been down towards the core, the iron core. Mars is covered in it because uh, Mars was orbiting around Tiamat when it was destroyed, so it was covered in this red powder. Mercury apparently was the, the core of this planet because it's pretty much all iron with a little bit of red dust on the outside of it. And Venus was also one of its orbiting moons, and it was destroyed. Now, the moon that we have, according to the Anunnaki, was captured by Ki, which is Earth. And um, they both sort of went out on their own and became uh, two system sort of orbiting planets, one around the other. And, and that's where, I don't know, I guess I started hearing that little needle scratch on the record because I knew the history of the moon, and that was not the history of the moon. The moon was not a natural satellite. It came in during a cosmic battle. And the Anunnaki, according to Sitchin's work, put this battle, not the battle, the explosion, at about 450,000 years. But I knew the battle was only about 12,000 years ago. And Sitchin tried to figure out when Planet X would come by. And for some reason, he dated it around that time, that um, 335, I think it is, 353, somewhere in there, AD. And so he figured it wouldn't be coming back for over 2,000 years. And uh, he tried to pin it with the Star of Christ, but it had nothing to do with that. I don't know why he didn't try and attach it to or look for the evidence being part of the um, Exodus, because it would have been perfect. He, everything would have fit as soon as he started looking into it. Anyway, so now we're 3,600 years after the Exodus, and it's returning again. When Christ was talking about the, the second coming, I guess the judgment day, the end of days, he said it would be as in the day of Noah. Uh, again, the flood of Noah's time occurred when Planet X flew back, flew through the system, and it's coming through again. So that part's fulfilled. However, the destruction that that should be taking place is being um, sort of sidestepped. They're they're assisting the planet. These these large sphere being lines that uh, Corey Good speaks of, they seem to be either masking its location or uh, like getting in the way of it and creating holograms or something because we should be able to see this object. I photographed it myself. At night, you, we can see Saturn with our eyes in the sky. Why can't we see this thing? It should be there already. It, it's, um, its effects are there. The gravitational pull is there. There, we just can't see the thing. That really bothers me. But I think if uh, people saw it, they might just lose their minds. So it might be a good thing that they're they're keeping it hidden for now. Uh, back to humans, why would we, we be so important? Apparently, Creator, when Creator formed humans, he was wanting humans to awaken to, um, not humans, souls, when he created souls. He wanted the soul to, to awaken, to, to be self-aware, not so much melded in a, hive mind, like a massive insect colony, which is what most human civilizations are like, or other world civilizations are like. They're also immersed uh, telepathically one with each other. There's no real ideas. They don't ever come up with any brilliant ideas. And here on Earth, they're, they're fascinated with how easily we can come up with ideas, how we can just write a song, have the music to go with it, and, and it sounds great, it's really catchy and makes sense. And they can't do that. Um, we can do it because we're disconnected from creator and we, we have sort of abandonment issues and the whole ego thing. Um, that seems to be very valuable to them because once you die here on earth and transition, um, your soul leaves and you go back, you seem to retain that. You retain the awareness of the I am. And we all have the I am. I am tired of this crap. I am sleepy. I'm hungry. Whenever you say I am, it, it separates you from the herd. you you're an individual awareness, a point in time and space, and you seem to maintain that and, and retain it when you go before creator. In meditations, when I first started meditating, I could lose myself completely, being what I call the nothingness, because there was no time, there was no 
space there was I did really know what century I was even in at the time I would just lose myself and it felt great there was I could not see anyone from any other country as an enemy at all because we were all one but once you come back into this form you have to sort of orient yourself okay I'm a male and I'm speaking English United States Texas South Texas Central Texas and you sort of reconnect with this this timeline we're in and um when we're back out there later on as you you repeat these meditations these particular meditations you maintain your point of awareness you can now hold a conversation with creator and um the bible seems to keep going back to that over and over that he wished to have a conversation with us but you can't have a conversation with someone when you're telepathic the conversation is over immediately it doesn't really it's not a conversation because you know what they're thinking and they know what you're thinking it's just a data transfer very rapid data transfer. So um, the reason I, was bringing, I wanted to speak about the crucifixion was because most people, they're really not even sure Christ existed. And when I was first doing my research, I had no intentions of writing a book. I wanted to just validate some stuff because I knew it was real. Some things had happened to me and I knew this had actually taken place. And I'm trying to figure out why would someone really believe that it wasn't real? And there's plenty of reasons for it. Um, Nazareth, the city of Nazareth, never existed. It, it was not there. It wasn't named on a map till about 400 years after Christ. Um, there is no Nazareth showing up in any of the Roman maps or any of the Greek maps. And when um, Josephus mentions, I think, 80 cities in Galilee, that area, there's, he doesn't mention Nazareth. Um, Nazareth was not a city. Nazareth was not a town. It's not a location. It's, it's a word. It means you're a heretic. You, you don't think the way they do. And there was another that they called Yeshua the, Nazar- the Nazarene. And he was about 20 years before Christ. He was, he was taken in stone because he thought he was a, a Messiah figure. But uh, Nazarene means you're a heretic. When uh, Paul, in one of the passages, is called the leader of the Nazarenes, that particular passage in Acts, when you look at it, look it up in different Bibles, it's translated as leader of the heretics. That word is interchangeable. It means heretics. So um, that he was Jesus the heretic, it doesn't come. We don't understand that. We don't see how they, why they would have called him that. And we think he was from Nazareth. Anyway, that was one of the reasons. The other one, and the most important one of all, are the Savior God religions. The Savior God's predate Jesus by thousands of years. They were all born of virgin mothers. They were all born on December 25th, the winter solstice. They had disciples. They could uh, do miracles, turn water to wine. Dionysus uh, turned water to wine so many times. He's considered the god of wine by the Greeks. He did it at, uh, at weddings. And he also rode an ass into um, Athens for his coronation. He was crucified. He was betrayed and crucified, and he resurrected from the dead. So did... Um, Mithra, Mithra was the last one to do it. He was Persian. He had 12 disciples, and he had something very similar to the Last Supper that Christ had. Uh, He was uh, betrayed, he was crucified, and he resurrected in two days. Now, what I found fascinating about these guys was that um, they were all betrayed. And I knew from the research I'd done that Christ was not betrayed. Nothing in, in the actual, the oldest known copies of the gospels does it use the word betrayal there it's just a specific word it's not there and the word they do use though is i will be handed over and paul uses this word later to say i'm going to, I, what i have been given i'm handing over to you um it cannot be taken to mean betrayal in any way shape or form but in our concordance it's been translated to be betrayal because you have to betray him to fit the um to fit this ideology of the savior gods and the savior gods spoke of a, of a hell if you did not believe the savior gods what they were teaching you would spend your eternity in hell but if you believed what they were teaching then you would be um, blessed and forgiven and you'd be in paradise for the remainder of your eternity i guess the eternity. these um this was considered heretical thinking even to the greeks when they were first introduced to it and in the scripture, the Hebrew scripture, there, there is no such thing as hell, as we understand it. There is a place called Shoal, and that can be translated as a ditch by the side of the road. It's just a, a low place. It's um, almost like a holding place. 
sometimes it's called the bosom of Abraham, sometimes it's called the realm of souls. That place did exist. Supposedly, Christ speaks more about hell than than all of the other uh, members of the Bible combined. But there there was no hell, and that took me that took me over a year to verify that. It just didn't sit right with me then. Well, how can you know what's his name? Um, Hitler not be you know punished for what he's done or or the people they're doing things they're doing now and um, it, it's because we're not we we weren't supposed to go there we're we're sort of like creator who has lost consciousness lost to his identity sort of separated himself from everything else in his creation and came down and uh, tried to figure things out and many people have heard this as one of the examples of our, our divinity or, or or godlikeness. Um, I, I believe that seems to be more true with the actual teachings of what Christ taught. Because when they asked him, are you the son of God? He said, uh, it is written, you are the sons of God. So he was trying to explain that uh, the soul, the body, and the body, the form that we have, that's just a vessel. Our soul inside the body, which moves uh has like passion, I guess is the word that they were using back in the ancient times. That is the spark of creation. That is spark of creator. So that is who you really are. And when this passes away, that will remain. And it was well understood that you could come back. It was called continuing life. Um, there's a section in the Bible. It's in Matthew um, chapter 11 and chapter 17, where the disciples ask Jesus, they're saying, well, wasn't Elijah supposed to come before you now Elijah died 800 years before so how can Elijah be showing up again and this was uh, very accurate Jesus said yes he was but they didn't recognize him and mistreated him in the same way they will mistreat him and he explained that John the Baptist was Elijah and that's uh, really hard for some Christians to accept it's in red lettering when, when they read it and that, that borders on reincarnation. But reincarnation means you come back as a cow or any other object. And this is uh, this is not like that at all. It's continuing life. You you come back to Earth. And I guess you try and do it again or do something again. Or whatever it is, you're trying to learn lessons. When I was uh, listening to Neil Donald Walsh on his um, conversations with God, he asked this question, why do we come back? Why come back to this? Why, why go through all this crap again? And then the creator asked, well, you're in a relationship right now, aren't you? And he goes, yes. Well, you, you understand what intimacy is, don't you? Goes, well, yeah. Okay, well, you, you know how it's going to start. You pretty much know how it ends. Why would you want to do it again? <laughs> he didn't have an answer for that. So it's, it's the, I guess, figuring things out. Because once you're out of the, this form, all this knowledge comes to you instantaneously. You, you may have hit that during meditations. You, you know everything at once. You just have this very clear understanding. But once we're back in, in our form, which is rather dense and shorts all that out, we don't. And when we have these aha moments, we figure things out. That's, that's pretty cool, really. And very few other species in the solar system, I mean, in this galaxy or this universe for that matter, can do that. They, uh, they're given a tremendous amount of information, and I believe, to give you an example of how this works, it's like, let's say your, your washing machine's not working, and you're not sure what's wrong with it, but you have an uncle who was, repairs washing machines, so you telepathically connect with him, tell him what the problem is, he goes, oh, I think your water pressure might be low, check and see if you don't have something clogging up your, your line, or somebody shut down some water, the water pressure, and you go and you fix it, so you, you fixed it, but you didn't really solve the problem. You sort of just uh, downloaded the information, looked it up, Googled it, and, and fixed it. But to actually solve a problem, that's a little bit different. And it, it does something to you. It's something you take with you when you're out of here. And back to the whole um, hell thing and not being punished. You're, I didn't say you weren't punished. There's a guy named Daniel Brinkley, and you can find him on YouTube. His oldest videos are probably the best when he's only died once because he's already died three times, hit by lightning every time. And when he died the first time, he, uh, he had still been with the Marines. He was out of the Marine Corps, but he had a pager on him. And when that pager went off, 
he had to go somewhere and hurt somebody or do some damage to the infrastructure of that country who did not happen to vote the way the United States wanted them to vote. So uh, he wasn't a very nice guy, and uh, he was kind of a bully in school. So he died. He got hit by lightning. He was on the phone telling a friend he had to get off the phone because he might get hit by lightning. And before he could hang it up, he got hit. Came in through the window and uh, took off his eyebrows and some of his hair. And he's kind of a reddish, pinkish looking color. Took about 28 minutes. By the time he, uh, he actually disconnected from his body and was pulled away. And he describes everything the way most people in the near-death experience describe it. Except that he was shown something. They said, would you like to see your life review? And he said, yeah, and we've heard of life review. We think it's our life passing before our eyes. And it kind of was. But what it was was him seeing the the pain he had caused to other individuals. And not only seeing it, but feeling it from their end. When he was in school, he was kind of a bully, liked to hurt people on the football field. So he got to be in uniform opposite uh, himself and knowing he was going to get pummeled by himself. And he got to feel that for every single individual. He did something like that, too. In combat, when he killed somebody, he, he saw himself shoot himself. He says after about seven times, you get tired of seeing yourself kill yourself. But you get to go through the pain, the fear of, of experiencing this person dying that you were responsible for killing. So in a, in a way, you get to experience it. You want to experience what it feels like to shoot someone. Guess what? You get to experience both sides of it. You want to experience raping a child and, and, and killing them. You get to experience both sides of that. And um, so there is a sort of judgment to it because you said afterwards he got to judge what had happened. And having seen both sides of it, he said, no one judges us harder than we judge ourselves. So it was a form of judgment. It was like, well, I could have done a whole lot better than that. And so he, he has. And it's amazing what he's, what he's done. And uh, I, I truly believe that's more along the lines of, of what happens because there is a hell. There really is. Um, it's, uh, it's not a nice place, but it's not where we were supposed to be sent to. Now, the Savior gods, again, this is what would happen to you if you did not uh, fall in line with their teachings. Now, when Christ resurrected, and this would go on with the, um, there's a lot of things that took place here, but when he was entombed, you had to remain dead for 72 hours before you were considered dead. They had what was called the death watch, I guess, for a better word. 72 hours, and after that, you would be considered completely dead. You were not going to be coming back to life. And there are accounts of people coming back to life within those 72 hours, up to almost the very last 70, uh, 70 second hour. Now, a while back in France, they were moving a cemetery out of the way because they were going to put a highway through there. And they discovered that half of the coffins were scratched up on the inside. These people came back to life once they were buried. So uh, they fixed that by embalming people so that they can't come back to life. But I'm sure you've ever heard all her stories where uh, the spouse wakes up and then their, their mate is, uh, is passed on, is dead. And I wonder so many times, what if you just did a 72-hour watch and this person might come back to life? Because that's exactly, that was well understood. That is what happened back then. So when Christ had to stay away from Lazarus for 72 hours, Lazarus was not even a young man. We would be considered a man at 12, 12 years of age. He was younger than that based on the research I did. And uh, he would have been very, very young. He's also the one that says the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's mentioned in, I think, Luke, and it's also mentioned in another one of the, uh, I think, Philip's gospel mentions it, the disciple whom Jesus loved, because he was raised, um, Jesus kind of raised him. Mary Magdalene was his older sister, and according to the research I've done, he definitely was married to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was much younger than she's portrayed, though. She was still a teenager. And um, this 72-hour period had to be obeyed. So when Christ died, in the understanding we have, it was Good Friday, he died. He's got Saturday and Sunday morning, he rises. From, that's not even 48 hours, it's barely 36 hours. So that wouldn't hold water back then. If, if somebody came back to life back then, they understood that was just a natural process. He had to be dead 72 hours. That's where my research took me, uh, trying to locate what the, the dates and what had happened. 
before the year 300, it was well known that Christ had died on a Tuesday, not on Friday, not on Good Friday. Now, Good Friday, uh, when I was growing up in school, uh, Sunday school, we were taught that it was the year 33 AD where Jesus had uh, been crucified. The reason that year was selected was because on the full moon, which is Passover, the 14th day of Nisan, has to be on a full moon. That would have been Friday. So you go back in the year 33 on a Friday, the day before the Sabbath would be the only day that that, that could have happened, except that uh, it doesn't give you the 72 hours. So if you go back two years, that full moon falls on a Tuesday, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, so that you have Wednesday, Wednesday's actual Passover, then you have um, Thursday. And uh, I got it backwards. <laughs> Wednesday today, uh, Thursday today, you have in between there, and then you've got. Um, I'm sorry, Thursday's the Sabbath. Friday's the day you have in between there, and the Sabbath, Saturday. In the Gospel of Luke, he describes this very carefully. He says that the women were paying attention to where Jesus was being entombed. So he was crucified. And he was entombed. It was the evening, and what screws this up even worse right now is that to the to that mindset, to the mind of the Israelites of that time, when the sun comes up in the morning, we understand uh, at midnight going forward, it's it's the next day. But not to them. At evening, when the third star could be seen, the shofar horns were blown at the top of the temple, and now it was the next day. So when they said the Sabbath is dawning, it wasn't the morning, it was the evening. From that night until the next day, that was the, that was their day, not from sunrise to sunset. It was uh, at sunset that became the next day. That evening became the next day. So Luke says that they observed, the women observed where the, Jesus was laid in the tomb, but the Sabbath day was dawning, so they had to stop work. Now, he sometimes says the Holy High Sabbath, the way it's translated. The Holy High Sabbath is not Saturday as we understand it. The Holy High Sabbath was the Passover the day that they uh, celebrate the Passover, because he says that then they rested after this, and then they had to rest again on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Commandment, that's the seventh day of the week. So you've got two Sabbaths in a week, and this information is nothing that we've been taught. We don't understand their culture at all. We don't understand they have a, they can have additional Sabbaths in there. Um Following this particular plan, this, this layout, if he died in the year 31, he would have had 72 hours in the tomb before he resurrected. The year that this took place, there was uh, two eclipses. Luke mentions there was an eclipse during the crucifixion of Christ, except that I just explained to you that Passovers only happen during full moons. So you can't have a solar eclipse and a full moon on the same day. You'd have them two weeks apart. Except that on this day they did. They had two full moons. Well, they had the, the daytime eclipse, which caused an earthquake because the moon should not have been there. And then they had the nighttime eclipse, was red, blood red eclipse. And Joel gave a prophecy, and this was the, the final prophecy, the final sign of Christ, who he was, that he was the Messiah. And by the moon doing this, the moon going into... Uh, into the eclipse in the daytime, the eclipse in the nighttime, that was the, the final sign. And it was, uh, Joel's a very short little book, but it says on that awesome and terrible day of the Lord, this would be the sign you would see that the sun would go dark at noon and the moon would be turned to blood. So when Peter repeats this during Pentecost, 50 days later, the, um, the people, 3,000 of them who had been there, the men, they had already seen what happened 50 days earlier, but couldn't explain it. They understood that the one they called Christ was the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah. And this uh, this eclipse, this dull eclipse, was not contested for 100 years. But after 100 years, people did start contesting it. There were several historians who wrote about it and said that there could not have been an eclipse, as Luke states, because that was a full moon. That was the night of a full moon. And other historians write back and say, if you just look in the annals of Rome, it's written there. And Pilate's, uh, Pilate had something called an exacta. It was a, a breakdown of what happened that year, and he had to submit it to the emperor. So 
in that writing, it mentioned there was eclipse, plus, of course, all the records of the tremendous earthquakes that took place. You would think if you were trying to push for the only son of God, the divine or semi-divine, uh, what would you call that? The way Hercules, Hercules was, a divinity, you would keep that in there. You would keep like that a in demigod? Your story. Yeah, demigod. You would keep that in there. And all the heroes were demigods. The were considered to be demigods. Perseus, he was considered a demigod. And what's fascinating, when I started researching the Nephilim, they were what you would call demigods. They were half Anunnaki, half human. And so they had all kinds of special abilities and powers. They were bigger, larger, more muscular um, giants, basically. But they were also human, intelligent, and they had a soul. The giants that were not born of the daughters of Adam and Eve – they did not have – those females didn't have what we just described as the matrix. So those giants didn't have souls. They were just mindless beasts. And that's where you get the two things where they were car they were cannibals. The things they did uh, in – you know, it just blows your mind some of the horrific things these giants were supposed to have done. And yet you have the Nephilim being called the, the great uh, men of renown, the heroes of old, because that they were. They're the ones that saved our bacon during the uh, reptilian battles. But here we have um, Diocasius. He describes how Claudius, he was an emperor, um, sent out a, a disclaimer, basically, to the army, explaining to them that an eclipse was going to happen on his birthday for them not to freak out. All it was was moving in the way the sun and his shadow casting onto the earth. They understood the earth was right then. They were circumnavigating the globe from the uh, research I've done. There's coins throughout the United States. There's uh, road vessels that have been found in rivers, way up inside rivers down in uh, Brazil. And so then bring in the Navy and dredge up the area and destroy the evidence because they don't want to rewrite history. But the Phoenicians and the Romans were circumnavigating the globe off of Christ in Holy all that time. From about the first half year, work he did there, he left and he went over to the Americas, and there is actually evidence of him being over here in the Americas. They made a documentary of it back in the 70s. I have not been able to locate it. But all the tribes described this man coming to them. He had um, a beard, long hair, of course, and he was wearing white, and he could perform all these miracles, and he, he could speak their language. And they were in the, in the ship. Remember, there's a story where Jesus is asleep, and the the disciples all panic, and he calms the seas, and they get to shore, and um, there's this this crazy guy who's possessed by uh, a legion of demons, and he's living in a narcopolis. There are no narcopolis surrounding Galilee. A narcopolis is a city of tombs. They found two tombs, and they're like two miles from Galilee. So they were actually uh, around the tip of um, Gibraltar when that happened in one of the ships of his uncle, Joseph of Arimathea. And there are actually stories of Jesus having uh, arrived there. Uh, Simka Djokovic, the guy who did the Naked Archaeologist, he did some research into that. That was quite fascinating. And that ship would have been large enough that Jesus would have been asleep and not realizing that uh, the disciples were freaking out. Because the, the little ships they use on, on Galilee, there's no way you're going to lay in that ship and have water coming over the sides and, and be asleep. You're going to get woken up with the cold water splashing on you. So um, the, the actual story of what happened is way different than the, the simple little story we're, we're told over and over and over. Also, um, one of the things of the, the story of Jesus, the Gospel of John, we, we assume it was John who was with Peter, during the trial, but the Gospel of John had no author assigned to it other than I was the one whom Jesus loved. I've already described that was Lazarus, and it's possible that Lazarus probably wrote that one because whoever wrote John did not write the Apocalypse, and whoever wrote the Apocalypse definitely wrote totally different than the author of John. So it looks like it was Lazarus who wrote that. And there were several other historians at the time, Tertullian, Thallius. They speak of the uh, darkening of the heavens, the eclipse that took place during the crucifixion. And at the time, they were contesting this and doing the, uh, what would you call it, apologiums, I think they call them. They were trying to explain to the, the sophisticated Romans 
that the Christians weren't crazy. They were describing an event that took place, and it's written in their history. Now, the there is something called the Annals of Rome, documentation of their history, the history of Rome. The thing is that the history of the years 31 and 32 are missing, and that was the year Jesus was crucified, the year 31. Also, uh, when, um, when the riches started taking off, the savior god priest started infiltrating the church, the young church, and the church was made up of, of peasants, basically, and uh, simple people who couldn't read or write, yet it was based on scripture. Somebody had to read. These guys quickly moved to positions of power, and right away, Peter and Paul both realize what's happening, and throughout Acts, they do describe what's happening, and they're saying, do not believe these individuals. Okay, now let's say I'm a priest of this, this Savior God religion. I'm going to say that Jesus is a demigod, that his father was this whichever god they chose, and the mother was a virgin. And that's, that's in line with the Savior God, because he resurrected from the dead. And that's why they started infiltrating, because Jesus resurrected from the dead. And uh, Paul and Peter both state not to listen to these guys, not to believe them. And they say Jesus Christ was born according, was born from the line of David according to the flesh. In other words, he was human. There was a conception. There was a man and a woman involved. And they both state this very clearly. So the whole demigod thing. That was added later. It was. It's not a concept of the Jews. The Jews don't understand uh, the whole demigod thing. That is a pagan concept, and it's uh, part of Christianity, but it's not supposed to be there because it is a pagan concept. If we can take that out of there and understand Jesus was human, and I don't take anything away from him that he was human. He was the Messiah. He fulfilled all the scriptures. He is the King of Kings, and I believe he's the one coming back. The whole demigod thing puts him out of perspective with us because – we can't do what he did if he's a demigod. Yet he said we will do everything he did and do it even faster and better than he did. So um, at this time, what's happening now, I believe, is um, part of this this energy that's – oh, just right. We're, we're heading toward a location in space that's, that's more energized and um, – that's going to be combined with the passage of Nibiru, and this energy is affecting people right now. They're, that's why you see um, all these marches and uh, people who – very emotional, very aggressive, very uh, – they just – if you're – I guess the way they described it is since we're polarity-based here on this reality, the polarities would become more polarized. You – were patriotic a little bit, now you're going to be a lot more patriotic. If you were liberal a little bit, now you're going to be further out there. And that's that's what we're observing right now. Except we're supposed to be getting um, higher and higher dosages of this. Earlier we talked about a shockwave that was coming. And um, in one of the passages, Christ says, I did not come to bring peace, I came to bring a fire to earth, and I wish it was already ablaze. The fire he's describing is not the fire of hell. When they described fire back then, there were like 45 different words for fire. But it meant anything that gave off light, like Elmo's fire. It gives off the light. You know, you know what's there, but it's got to be some kind of fire because it's lighting everything up. So this fire that he speaks of is coming from the center of the galaxy. These galaxies were discovered by Seyfert. He was a scientist who was an um, astrophysicist. And he was examining the photographs of quasars because now they had the Hubble and had much better imaging systems. Quasars, um, when I was in school, I think they gave us one little short sentence about quasars that no one could understand how it was possible for a quasar to have that much power, that much light and shine for as long as it did. But that didn't really tell you what a quasar was. So when he's examining these quasars, these photographs of quasars, you're looking at a star. And at the edges of the star, right, right around the equator, you're seeing these fingers of galaxies sticking out, the edge of the, of the arm of a galaxy sticking out. So then he wondered, is it possible that these quasars are actually spiral galaxies? And so he looked around, looked around, and they finally captured one igniting. Uh, 
And when it ignites, it fires a plume of energy straight up perpendicular to the disk and straight down. And our own galaxy, they've, they've discovered these plumes. They look kind of purplish in color by the imaging they use. And so they have to come up with some kind of theory of something. No, but nothing escapes the black hole. So how did these two plumes do that? Uh, what they don't realize is that the galaxy has gone quasar. And this ring of fire is launching in all directions along the disk out towards the edge. We're about 25,000 light years from the center. And these plumes are about 25,000 light years in distance from the center of the galaxy. So we're getting due to get hit pretty soon. And when I was uh, speaking to John Moore today, earlier, he um, he asked me how far out I thought these plumes were. And I said a couple of years before we get hit with a real, the main wave, the strongest one. Because we were getting hit already. We are getting hit with these, sh these shock waves that are striking the planet. And he said that his sources tell him something similar 20 to 21 months before we, we strike, we get struck with this wave. The Lakota speak of it. Um, they don't like to talk about it because Christians would see it as a form of judgment. It's a fire that will purify the planet. It's an energy that is so close to creator. If you could bottle it, you could pretty much say this, this is the energy of God. So it's, um, it's such a pure high vibration frequency. It's basically like bottling the power of love. So when this thing strikes the planet, anything that is not in harmony with it, it will be burned away. Uh, fear one of them so you can't be afraid when this the shock wave comes it won't catch you unawares you'll see it coming it's coming from the center of the galaxy right where where scorpio is it's a very easy constellation to see in the southern sky the tip of scorpio's tail right above the tip of the of scorpio's tail to the left of that is sagittarius and he's pointing with his bow the arrow is pointing right at the center of the galaxy so it'll be coming from that direction it'll look like a blue star and then it'll get bigger and bigger and eventually take up the whole sky before it strikes the earth. But that is, um, I believe that is what everybody's waiting for, what they call ascension. Because once that thing strikes, you will literally be metamorphosed into a higher dimension instantaneously or you will not be here anymore physically. I'm sure spiritually you'll be somewhere, but um, nothing that's evil can withstand that energy. Also, nothing that's afraid will be able to to stand in the presence of that energy, it'll, it'll strike very fast. And um, I remember being a child and asking, why can't we, you know, see God or talk to God or be in the presence of God? And I said, oh, you're a sinner, you know, so uh, all your sin would just uh, burn in front of the presence of, uh, of God, the divinity, the goodness of him. And I thought, well, okay. <laughs> but it's kind of like that, but it's not a judgment. It's just you're just not ready for it. So when that happens, though, we become light bodies instantaneously, exactly what Christ demonstrated on the crucifix. That's what he came to uh, show us, that human being can become a light body. And he did it by showing these, you know, I guess in the pyramid, Maslow's pyramid hierarchy, you have uh, your self actualization at the very top and at the very bottom you have basic survival instincts and um, in this world where the reptilians seem to rule they keep us in the two lower tiers the basic survival and the one where you can find a home and kind of start getting some provisions set up but if you get beyond that you you have more than enough so you help your neighbor well they don't want you helping your neighbor they want you to be in survival mode all the time so christ had no no means of survival he was crucified he was nailed to a cross and yet he maintained the highest form of um, I guess spiritual awareness and I guess the way he behaved was supposed to be unimaginable the Romans had to create a word for it so the Romans would climb up there and cut their tongues out. You were supposed to die from exhaustion or bent slightly, and your arms are outstretched. And just some simple physics, mathematics. You have about 3,000 pounds of torque on that median nerve because they, they put the nail right inside the wrist, right below all those bones. So in that nerve area, it's pushing on your body weight, it's pushing down on that, and it's about 3,000 pounds of pressure. To get off of that, you have to push up, and they use two more nails for that. Now, 
they had to use one for Christ's feet because one was stolen. But the, uh, they would normally use four nails. They'd place your foot on the side of the beam, and they would drive the nail through the heel bone, which is uh, it's large enough to hold the nail, into the wood. So you'd push up with this nail in your heel bone to be able to exhale because your muscles would tighten up across your chest and you couldn't exhale. So you push up and you exhale and then you collapse again until you have to push up again to exhale. Your body will do it uh, almost subconsciously. And so you'll, you'll be there in pain until you die. If you're not nailed to the cross, you'll last there a lot longer than you, you were if you were nailed. It seems to cause some sort of shock and you die sooner. The, um, the guys who had their legs broken once uh, the Sabbath was over, or the Sabbath was dawning, rather, um, that was not done out of cruelty. That was sort of uh, a coup d'etat, I guess, the shot and the kiss of death. By breaking their legs, they couldn't push up anymore, and they would suffocate. They would bring about a, a quicker death, because you could be on the cross for days. And um, three days after that, maybe two hours after that, he resurrected. Now, a resurrection is not the same thing as coming back to life. David Wilcock does a tremendous amount of research on this, on these um, guys in the East who become light bodies, rainbow bodies, they call them. There's over 150,000 documented cases of these guys, and there's more than enough evidence that Jesus was there. His name is inscribed into um, temples that are there, into palaces that are there. And some of these have been lost because the, all we have is a photograph or the etching of what was written. It was destroyed. It was taken off of there because, uh, I, I don't know, I guess archaeologists didn't want people to believe that Jesus was out in that area, what they call the missing years. And that's where he was. And um, he was in the Valley of Kashmir. He was in several of the monasteries down there, some of the more important monasteries. He ran into a lot of trouble over there also, telling people that they, they were doing it wrong. The whole caste system, he didn't like that at all. And um, anyway, when he became a light body, uh, being a light body is really unique. And if we can all do this, it would it would elevate the galaxy, I guess, in a, in a, a way that's never happened before. And I'll describe that in a little bit. But um, if you have a light body, you can change your appearance. That's why when they saw him on the road and spoke with him, they didn't realize it was him because you can change your appearance. You can also teleport, move from one location to another. You can walk through a door. You can walk through a wall. You can sit down and eat. You're not a ghost. And um, all that is some of the stuff Christ did. Now, I mentioned that uh, if we all become light bodies, we could change the galaxy. The Pleiadians have a ship and the Pleiadians are, um, they call themselves the Pleiadians. They come from the region of the Pleiades, which is that little star cluster on the butt area of uh, Taurus. It looks like a little tiny dipper in the sky, very bright. And there's supposed to be seven stars there. Six are very easy to see, the seventh one is kind of hard to tell whether there's seven or nine. But they're called the Seven Sisters. And these Pleiadians have a ship that was given to them. It's made of element 115. It can move through time. The way they use their graviton uh, repulsors, they can select a point in space and move there very quickly. Or if they don't move, they hold their position. They can select a place in time and move forward or backward through time. Um, Billy Meyer has photographs of these, these ships. He was taken on board the ship, and he has some photographs that he took on from the ship. The ship itself... Um, they took it into the future. It, it's not a technology they have. It was given to them by another race. But they took it into the future, and they were trying to just do history of uh, how the, the galaxy formed, how, I mean, how the universe formed, the patterns that the galaxies will take in the future, that sort of thing. But in one of the futures, they discovered that, that on every world in this particular galaxy, there were these masters, kind of like super Jedi – who also had all the capabilities of Christ. So you could send an army against these people. They would just hold their hand up and all the bullets would stop moving, much like in the Matrix. Then they could just disable all your equipment and uh, you killed somebody, they would just bring them back to life. So you can't really stop these guys. And they were peaceful. And they were trying to raise the vibration, the frequency, the spiritual consciousness of every world they came across. Now, when they did a calculation 
destiny of these people had to be in the galaxy as close to six billion. That was a number they couldn't wrap their heads around because there's no way six billion people are on any one world. At the most, they have about 500,000. And they traced it back through time, and it was here on Earth. Those six billion came from Earth. And that's why Earth is, is – um, everybody's here to watch what happens right now to see if we can really pull this off because we're on that path. Of all the timelines, we are on that timeline. I mentioned the Mandela effect before. The timelines are, are sort of weaving one into another at this point. And um, one of the best examples I can give of this is the passage in Isaiah that says, um, and the lion shall lay down with the lamb. A lot of people like that passage. There's uh, groups of Christians called the lions and the lambs. And there's posters you can go buy at Christian stores that have a lion in it laying down with a lamb. The problem is that the passage no longer reads like that. In this timeline, somehow, somehow something got shifted. The passage now reads, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. I don't care if you have an old dusty Bible that belonged to your grandpa or grandma and it's up in the attic. You go bring it down. It will say, the, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. It no longer reads lion. So uh, this dimension, something got shifted. The... Um, the fascinating thing, though, is that if you go to a Christian store, you'll see the lion and the lamb laying down, but it'll still read, and the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. And that makes no sense whatsoever, because we remember it as reading, the lion shall lay down with the lamb. And there's quite a few other little things that take place. Um, I was wondering if the research I did wasn't somehow a Mandela effect, because I can prove that Judas never betrayed Jesus. He simply didn't. Um, the story we're told is that he did. And uh, Jesus was arrested by the Jews, and they tried to railroad him. That's not what happened. He was arrested by the Romans, and it was an offense against Rome. And lately, I've been seeing uh, the word sedition on a lot of headlines, sedition against the president. That was not a word people were familiar with. Because that's that's what Jesus got arrested for, sedition against the emperor. And it took me a long time to find what it was that he was guilty of. I was, um, the best way I can describe it is that the Holy Spirit told me that Jesus was guilty and I had to find that evidence. And most of the evidence of all the writings I've done, all the work I've done, it goes right back to the, to the Gospels. About 75% of the evidence, as much as 80%, comes directly out of the four Gospels you'll have in your hand. So you can quickly reference whatever it was I'm speaking about. But um, Judas did not betray Jesus. He was actually his closest companion. Jesus, in the Gospel of Matthew, when they're under arrest and Judas is there with the arresting party, it is translated as friend. But what are you doing here? But it wasn't the word he used. The word he used is comrade. What are you doing here? When they use the word um, to befriend someone, there's there's so many words in English that just don't match up to the, the Greek. The Greek would have eight words for the word love. I think they have seven words for the word brother or um, friend. Like phylos from Philadelphia. That would mean brotherly love. And uh, comrade, that is your closest highest form of friendship. Jesus does not ever address any of the other disciples as comrade. Jesus um, took Judas pretty much everywhere he went. He was a favored disciple. Also, Judas looked a lot like Jesus. He was um, what the one they called the twin, Thomas. And Da Vinci points this out in the uh, my book. They put that it was the prequel to the Da Vinci Code. I, I would not have worded it that way, but um, it seems to be because it brings out a lot more stuff that um, they did not go into in the Da Vinci Code. In The Last Supper, the uh, guy sitting to the left of Jesus is an identical twin of the person who's described, you know, portrayed as Jesus. He looks just like him. Well, that's the twin. There's legends of this twin, this double called Didymus, and um, – some people um, call him the identical twin brother of Jesus, and my research pretty much points to the fact that that's exactly who he was, the identical twin brother of Jesus. He had been separated at birth. Um, I also found out that there's a tomb in Kashmir, and uh, that tomb is attributed to Jesus because Mary's tomb is not far from that. But that is not the tomb of Jesus. That is the tomb of his identical twin brother who returned with Mary over to Kashmir after that. He left the 
provinces of Israel. So if Jesus did not have an identical twin brother, then I can, I guess, we can go take a tour of his tomb because it's in Kashmir. Um, the other thing that I found out, and that's why I'm wondering, are we like in a Mandela effect? Because this is way different, and all the evidence is there very clearly. Um, the story of Judas having committed suicide, that shows up later. And the story, there's two different stories. One, he threw himself off a cliff, and one that he, he hung himself. And some people like to put them together. He tied a rope around his neck and threw himself off a cliff. And um, that eventually his bowels burst down there, and they, it's called the field of blood. But um, when they select this, another disciple to take Judas's place, Peter's very clear about it. He said, so that Judas may go where he must, because he was supposed to go back to Kashmir with Mother Mary, who wanted to return to that area. Um, Jesus did resurrect. He did ascend. He... Um, fulfilled all the prophecies he was supposed to and he he is considered the first one who ever woke up you know how i described waking up at consciousness well as far as i know he's the first one who's ever done it so he's called the unique son of god and um when he came here to change the world he had to do it by being born human do it from the inside the same way that um According to Dolores Cannon, we were all volunteered and volunteered to come and change this world. Now, um, if there's going to be a second coming, then we all expect an apocalypse, and we expect World War III, and we expect all these things. Well, the cabal, what they call the cabal, the ones in charge of the planet, would love to have World War III. And so they, they keep trying to instigate World War III to create the apocalypse. The problem is World War III and the apocalypse doesn't happen until the very end of the chapter. That's after everything's already happened and they're sort of fighting for resources, it looks like. But um, it doesn't happen at the beginning of the, of, the, of the apocalypse. When I was following the what's called Bible Code, um, have you ever done any research into the Bible Code? A little bit. Well, what they first started doing, and it's not the whole Bible. Some guys will take the book of Moby Dick and look for stuff in there to show that it's, it's nonsense. It's not the entire Bible. It's only the first five books, the Torah. 308,000 characters, that's it, that is it. So out of these 308,000 characters, they'll take your name, um, they, they took the names of prominent rabbis, is what they did at first, and they placed them in equilateral uh, sequence lettering. In other words, the first letter of the, let's say the name Malachi, shows up after, um, well, it just shows up, and between that one and A, the letter A, then you've got uh, 762 characters and between that one and the letter l you have the same amount of characters so they're equal level distancing the problem is they don't have vowels so i probably shouldn't have used that word that name <laughs> it's got an a in it they just have consonants once they get these names they put them in line the the um, matrix of the bible code those three hundred eight thousand sequences come up with the the name and so then they'll line this name up straight up and down vertically, and now you have what looks like a huge page where you circle and try and find words that are hidden in there. And what they found was the year this man was born, the year he died, the universities he taught at, the uh, some of the more amazing things that he did with life. So Bible Code was very impressive to me. In the year of uh, right about the time we got hit with the first shockwave, it described the Earth as being annihilated by a comet, and the only comet that would have done that would have been Ison, and Ison would have annihilated us, trust me, from the what I've discovered about comets. Comets cause an entire world's atmospheres to ignite because of the electrical interference, and with all the aluminum that was spraying into our atmosphere, we would have ignited. So uh, one of the things they've done was disassemble the comet as it was coming in. I have uh, on the cover of... It's National Geographic. It says Comet of the Century, and it's Ison. It's supposed to be 16 times brighter than the moon. I couldn't find that thing with uh, some uh, 60, 700 power binoculars with zoom on them, and I had a special telescope to look for it. I could not find it, not even as a star. It was so tiny. They disassembled it because it would have it would wipe down our planet, and it stated in Bible code in that year that the Earth would have been annihilated by a comet. It also goes into uh, World War III, that the war would have started in the year 2006. So apparently, 
based on Bible code, the apocalypse has already happened. The only problem is that so many came to this world, volunteered to come to this world to raise the frequency so that the horrible thing that happened in the future wouldn't happen this time. And somehow we've altered the timeline and we're in a timeline that never existed before. We're, we've gone beyond 2012 where they say there was no time. And so we're, we're sort of in a no time and whatever happens is what we create, what we want for the future. Kind of like when we all came out and decided we don't like the way the government is being run. We want some things changed and we, we changed them. Um, we're in a time right now where it's not supposed to be here. We're not supposed to, as far as revelation goes, the, the timeline doesn't go this far. It should have ended a while back. So I think that's why all these um, dimensions are meshing. We're getting pieces from other dimensions that don't make any sense in, in our dimension. But I do believe that the uh, uh, planet X is, is on its way back. And I, I believe it has everything to do with what we understand as the second coming. And what I found really fascinating was with um, Mead's work, David Mead. What he described as taking place in the heavens, that doesn't matter what timeline you're in. That's going to take place because it's a celestial event and everybody will see it. It doesn't matter what timeline you're in. So I guess we'll see what happens in September, the end of this year. That's when this object is supposed to be um, visible to the naked eye. And again, I don't expect the destruction that's been prophesied. I don't expect any any of that to happen only because we, we have had trem a tremendous amount of off-world help and assistance in uh, preventing the damage so far. And... Um, uh, have you ever heard of uh, something called the RV, the remote viewing revalu revaluation? No, the revaluation of currency here in the United States, where the dinar, the dong, and the zim are supposed to be revalued, giving money to a tremendous amount of people who are going to use it for humanitarian efforts to rebuild the planet. Um, when Trump was talking about this latest bill that he put out for fixing the infrastructure of the United States, federally, that'll be for the federal highways and bridges, but also by state people from the areas to do the work, from the local areas for fixing those bridges and fixing those roads and things like that. But then he also said the, and the other part of the money will be coming from the private sector, and that's what the RV is involved with. When the RV finally happens, basically the president's going to announce that we have a new currency it's called the USN, the United States Note. It's a rainbow currency and it's backed by gold. Um, he hasn't done it yet. <laughs> I don't know when he's going to, but once he does that and he announces what's called the RV, the currency revaluation, from what I understand, seven days after that, there will be mass landings of these ships all over the uh, the planet, actually, and they'll start appearing in the skies. And they'll, they'll be very big. You will not be able to mistake them for, for aircraft or for dirigibles or for clouds or, or swamp gas. You'll know that they're, they're ships. And they'll be landing, but they will not be landing near populated areas. You're supposed to go to them if you want to make contact with them. And that's supposed to occur within seven days of, of the president announced this thing. Anyway, I wanted to mention that because um, we're very close to that, very close to him announcing that. And when he does announce it, this will happen. The reason it'll happen is because we are too close to the shockwave that's coming. We are running out of time. And if humans aren't taught properly how to... Uh, I guess, practice, meditate, be kinder to each other, practice um, random acts of kindness and still their minds and meditate, I guess, understand what's about to happen and not be afraid. We're going to lose a lot of people with the shockwave. We're probably going to lose a lot of people when the ships manifest anyway. They'll probably just drop dead of heart attacks. But um, right now, that's, that's something I'm willing to live with because <laughs> – they, we were about to run out of time. We're going to lose a lot more people if they don't show up. Well, certainly you have brought a lot of information to the table, Joseph. I mean, you've connected so many dots going from prophecy, Planet X. Now you're talking about currency reset and then disclosure. So this will definitely give our audience a lot to chew on tonight. And I would recommend our audience check out the book Incredulous. Now, Joseph, Five Eagles, Reina, if you go to Amazon, or where would you recommend they pick this book up? Amazon's probably one of the better, the, the ones you can get it faster because they'll um, print it on their light source. You can get the printed version. And there's um, several others. I think it's called Print to Copy or something like that. Um, the one from 
Apple Apple has it as well. Those are mostly all the iBooks. I mean, the little um, digital versions of it. If you want the actual book to hold, most most of the older population does. They like the the book they can hold in their hand, write notes on, highlight things. Because there's a tremendous amount of research in that book. I had to leave a lot of things out, but um, I left as much as I could in there. And you will you will spend days going back over the research. Everyone who's read it says I have to read it again, and I'm going to have to do it with a notebook this time because uh, the research is, is quite impressive. Stuff you haven't heard before, really. It's not the same old rehashing at all. It it will shock you, some of the stuff that's in there. And then when you go back and open your Bible and look at it and see that it is there, you, you'll start to wonder what happened. Why is this in there? It wasn't there before. Or how could they leave this out and not describe it, explain it to you? But, yeah, Amazon would be one of the one of the better ones, one of the faster ones. Fantastic. And is there another way to contact you, Joseph? I know you're on Facebook. Do you have a website? No, I, I have created under Facebook something called the Acolytes Quill. And under the Acolytes Quill, I post um, different information, like the discoveries taking place down in Antarctica, a few things about the revaluation. And I put quite a few things in there whenever I find them of uh, Steve Pachenik. Dr. Steve Pachenik, because he's explaining what's happening with WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks was not leaked by the Russians. Uh, this information was given to them by the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, because they needed to stop what was happening in our government and basically take the government back. Um, he's very, very impressive, and he's brilliant with strategy. And he basically describes this was going to take place, this was going to happen. These are the people being arrested, these are the people being taken out. By taken out, it doesn't mean they're gonna get killed. There's no reason for bloodshed anymore. We've won, uh, it's just a matter of time. So hopefully um, we will win as he thinks we will, and we'll get the proper disclosure. Um, proper disclosure would mean complete release of what these people have done to the crimes against humanity because the uh, industrial, military industrial complex you remember Project Paperclip, where they brought in all the Nazis? Well, these Nazis moved to positions of power because these people weren't aware that they were Nazis. And they also communicated with the ones down in Antarctica, the um, New Schwabenland, the uh, Nazi base down there. And they've actually created what's called um, – it's cosmic corporate conglomerate, I think they call it. So they've got bases on Mars, and these bases – uh, they actually recruited people here the, uh, from the world, some of the best and brightest, and got them out there. But once they got them out there, they told them that uh, all kinds of wars have happened over here, diseases, and they can never come back, and they're the last hope for humanity, but they're being treated like slaves. So all that has to come out. These people don't want that information coming out. They also don't want all the pedophile stuff coming out and all the crimes they've done against humanity coming out. That's When they say full disclosure, that's what they mean, full disclosure. And um, hopefully we'll be seeing that before the year's end, because like I said, we are running out of time before that shockwave strikes. So I post things like that. I post things like that in, in there. Well, I'll tell you, certainly we live in some amazing times, and I've wondered myself too, with all the doom and gloom we hear about so frequently, I'm like, well, we're here, things are going good, I can go to the fridge, I can you know, crack open a nice beverage like this kombucha tea that I'm drinking right now, and we have so many awesome opportunities. And I definitely want to leave tonight on a positive note that even though it sounds like there's a lot of, of possibilities out there, you know, look at the good look at the good things. We are absolutely doing amazing things with Leak Project and other avenues, people that have been with me uh, since the start listening to the program. You know, I couldn't do this without you guys and you know, much respect to everybody that leaves a comment, listens to the show, shares the show. Joseph, I really appreciate you spending two hours out of your evening to do this. I know you're a very busy person. You have a lot of stuff that's going on. And just the fact that you put so much information together in two hours, I think that that's great. And I would also recommend our audience, you know, here's something that's really cool that's coming up. Join us for the upcoming X-Fest in South Dakota at Vivos X-Point, where you can meet up and have an opportunity to team up with other members and actually secure your own X point bunker. I actually own one now. It's awesome. I'm going to turn it into a vacation home and also a studio to where I can do multiple shows out of there when I don't want to be in the city. I mean, cause here in San Antonio, Joseph, you live out here in San Antonio. Has this place not grown like crazy over the past five years? I mean, every week it seems like the traffic gets 
more intense out here. And as much as I love it out here, South Dakota is amazing. I don't know if you've ever been to the Black Hills out there by Mount Rushmore, Crazy Horse, the Badlands. It's a beautiful area. So I'm really excited to get out there. We have literally teamed up with Vivos to bring people together for this Vivos X point where you can literally get a concrete bunker, military grade, it was designed by the military to withstand some incredible damage. So I'm really excited to get out there. Hope it's going to be like Burning Man, but not as many liberals. Okay, that was a bad joke. <laughs> well, every, hey, thanks a lot again, Joseph. It was real nice to talk to you. And ladies and gentlemen, question everything and be the change you want to see. Mm -hmm.